Hey guys, thanks for tuning back in again. Uh, this is All Things Chess with Cybertail. I am Cybertail, also called John Cole. Um, as I continue these series of videos, you'll notice I have an ever-growing collection of snazzy hats. This is one of the hats that my grandpa wore back in the day, so I'm happy to wear it for today's session. Um, by popular demand, I did some polls and did some questioning of uh, my fan base. Our next series of videos going forward is going to be on isolated pawns. Um, this is, by and large, one of the most important positional and structural concepts to deal with in chess. So if you're able to get play with and against isolated pawns down, you're covering a humongous amount of uh, territory that makes you stronger stronger player. So this is going to be a basic introductory video. If you're a bit more of an advanced player, you could potentially skip this video and be fairly comfortable. But I want to make sure that I'm covering everything for every le uh, level of player. So... Uh, everyone feels kept in and no one feels left out. So first off, basic best definitional stuff. What is an isolated pawn? An isolated pawn is one where it doesn't have an adjoining pawn on either file to help protect it. So let me get a position on the board uh, to demonstrate that concept. So d5, c4, we'll just play some basic opening moves to get an isolated pawn on the board. e3, e6, c5. So right now, the pawn on d4 is not isolated because it has this pawn on e3 to support it. Castle, take. All right, so now we have the, an isolated pawn here. The pawn on d4, there's no white pawn on the e file to support it, and there's no white pawn on the c file to support it. That makes this an isolated pawn. Um, why are isolated pawns a big deal? Generally, pawn structures, their quirks sort of detail and control the entire course of the game. And that's no different for isolated pawns. Isolated pawns have good features and they have bad features. I'll cover the bad features first. First off, an isolated pawn is just flat out a pawn weakness. Um, if black finds a way to attack this pawn, white can't just defend it with a pawn. He has to either defend it with another piece, he has to move the pawn forward, or he has to ignore the pawn and make it a pawn sacrifice somehow. So I just do a few more moves just to demonstrate what I mean by this. Let's say rookie one, castle, a3. Again, these aren't necessarily optimal opening moves. I'm just getting the concept on the board. So rookie a8. So um, white is guarding the d-pawn twice, but black is now attacking it one, two, three times. Uh, white can either choose to defend the pawn somehow. He could play knight b5 to defend it. He could either push it somehow, which isn't the best choice in this position, or he could choose to sacrifice the pawn um, and try to get compensation for it. But there is no option of simply defending the pawn with another pawn. He doesn't have e3, he doesn't have c3. Isolated pawns are a weakness because they can't just be shored up by another pawn. If black finds a way to concentrate his firepower on the d-pawn, white will either be forced into passivity or it will be forced to sacrifice a pawn and find some compensation for it. Also, another basic feature of isolated pawns, um, the pawn itself isn't just weak, but the squares in front of the pawn are weak. So I'll demonstrate a little bit what I mean by that. Um, in this position, it's black to move. The pawn in front, or the square in front of the pawn, d5, is a weakness. The weaknesses aren't just pawns, they're also squares. Um, on knight d5, white could choose to take, but there's no option of driving the knight away with a pawn. That is uh, a pure outpost, what's called a pure outpost square for black. Black can put his piece on d5, and he doesn't have to worry about it being driven away by a pawn. He can just sit that piece there, and that gives his position quite a bit of stability. Um, also, the square d6 is also a weakness, because again, there's no white pawn on the c file or e file, that can come along to drive that piece on d6 away. So an isolated pawn, it's not only a pawn weakness, but it gives the other side some stability to arrange his pieces. Black can put whatever he wants in d5 or d6, and he doesn't have to worry about those pieces being driven away by pawns. So those are the main bad features of isolated pawns. So with those in mind, why would anyone accept an isolated pawn when it is strictly a weakness? Um, First off, just an aside, not all isolated pawns are necessarily a weakness. And I'll demonstrate 
what I mean by that, but just sort of an example position. So let's say d6, d4, c3, e5. This is just a random opening variation to get a concept on the board, but this is a somewhat well-known opening position. Um, so here, black not only has isolated pawns, but they're doubled isolated pawns. But here, most strong players would most likely agree that black is either perfectly fine or even slightly better here. So what's the difference in the two positions? Well, here, uh, the isolated pawns for black aren't on an open file. If you have an isolated pawn, it's not a weakness if it can't be attacked. Here, white can't put a rook on e2 or e3 and just tee off on the pawns because there's a white pawn on e4. So it's a completely closed file. There's no danger for white of having... Uh, there's no danger for black of having those isolated pawns attacked. Um, also, isolated pawns can control some very important squares. So to go back to the other example position. Um, here the white pawn controls the key square of e5. That's also an outpost square for white. Uh, if white defends the uh, white pawn on d4 sufficiently, he can play knight e5, and it's hard for that knight on e5 to be driven away. You know, black can't really play f6, that would be more or less positional suicide. Um, so the white pawn does control some important squares. People accept an isolated pawn with the idea of generating activity and compensation for it. So in this position, white has a half-open e-file, so white can play, play rookie one. Uh, this is a very strong piece. It uh, points down at that important square of e5, and it's just a very active post for the rook. White also has an open c-file to potentially use, where he could put another rook there eventually as well. Um, white also has very simple plans here, just... I'll just play some quick opening moves. G5. And white has very, uh, very simple plans of attacking on the king side with his active pieces. Um, in this particular position, the black bishop on uh, c8, it's sort of hemmed in. It doesn't have a lot of uh, obvious spots for activity here, whereas white has very free and open development, partially due to the isolated pawn. So generally, in these positions, people take on the isolated pawn to generate activity and compensation for it, and the people facing the isolated pawn try to limit that activity from the other side, try to trade pieces off, and take the position to an end game where the pawn weakness can be more adequately exploited. Um, first off, definitionally, we are going to be looking at isolated d-pawns. Um, I would say, of isolated pawns, 95% of what is talked about with isolated pawns are isolated d-pawns. Um, that's largely a function of what openings are actually played um, and what concepts are actually in play in those. So just a quick example of a semi tarash So f6, e6, c5, so in this position white technically has an isolated a pawn. Um, no one would, no one would really think of the a pawn as really isolated. Uh, it's sort of stuck off in the middle, uh, the corner of the board. Um, it can't really be attacked. It's not an open file. So we really don't think of the uh, A pawn as an important feature as an isolated pawn as part of this position. Um, nearly all of what we learn about isolated pawns are isolated D pawns. Um, now, this isn't just op uh, opening specific. It's important to grasp isolated pawns because you can get an isolated pawn from virtually any position. If you play D4 as white, it is absolutely essential to understand isolated pawns in and out, because you will be getting those in your repertoire. Uh, if you play black, um, you'll be facing d4, so you have to understand isolated pawns. But even if you play white and you play e4, there's still plenty of ways to get isolated pawns. So for instance, if black plays the French, d2, again, not necessarily optimal opening moves, but here again, in this line of the French, Black accepts an isolated pawn in hopes of generating adequate activity and compensation for it. Um, in certain lines of the Sicilian, let's say white plays the c3 Sicilian. c6, again, not necessarily the optimal moves, but once again here, we have an isolated pawn, and both sides need to know how to deal with this adequately. Um, so I think this is good as an introductory video. The basic path for what's coming next, I'm going to spend the next couple of videos looking at an important feature of the physician, which is, there we go, 
Um, whenever you're analyzing a position, it's important to always analyze your pawn breaks. That's going to be something that comes up with me more or less every video, because I think it's one of the most important features as a position. And white's most important pawn break is the only pawn break. It's d4, d5, because that's the only pawn break in the board, because white controls it. That gives white quite a bit of power over the position. So the next couple of videos, I'm going to be looking at black controlling the d5 square and white achieving the d5 pawn break in uh, uh, favorable circumstances. So this will be good as an introductory video to that. I'm going to be working on that in those next couple of videos in the next couple of days. Um, my name is Cybertile, also John Cole, and I'll see you here in a bit.